so we are going to do a book review. Brett the Best is here, and Kit Kinetic's over there. Wave. Oh, and this is Coco. This is the devil dog introduced in one of our other videos. Dan, we haven't got an answer. <coughs> Should it be Demonchi or Demonchi? <laughs> mm, Demonchi. <laughs> Dementia. <laughs> Dementia. That, that, may be the, that may be it. That may be us at the end of the trip. <laughs> oh, probably during the trip, too. <laughs> right. Okay. We are reviewing The Enchanted Forest. It's been a while since I've read it. Well, Mark reads it. So. This is true. Mark <laughs> does read it, and he reads it amazingly. Yes. If you haven't found Mark's read, Mark reads, oh, holy crap, <laughs> then uh, you're missing out. This is what we're reviewing. That! See? The Enchanted Forest. <laughs> that way. <laughs> My wrist! <laughs> By Pris Patricia C. Patricia. Patricia C. <laughs> read! Yep. Okay. What are your fond memories of this book? Ah, uh, Simran. Is that how you pronounce it? I thought it was Simran. You know, it really depends on who's reading it. That's the way a lot of words are. It's true. But the rebellious princess. Yeah. She's awesome. Yes. I love a good rebel princess. I like Mandenbar. Mindenbar? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the dragon. Oh, yes. And the witch, <laughs> whose name all of a sudden I have blanked. Merwin. Merwin? Yeah. And and her cats. Oh, all, all of All of the cats. <laughs> the one who seems really out of place is Daystar. Yeah. He's just... I don't know. I couldn't get into that story. Damn, you're pale. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Holy shit. <laughs> this camera just makes me look paler. <laughs> Um, my sister is actually about the same color I am, but she looks about four shades darker than me. Yeah. You know, these things, it's humiliating, really. And I'm like the same color as the curtains. <laughs> Blend. 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 Okay. What are you doing? Oh, that was just a still. <laughs> You're okay. trying to record me. Yeah, I, you're I, much less pale this way. I have... Get up to see me that video so I can do a comparison. Mm -hmm. Okay. You're trying to record me. Yeah, I, you're I, much less pale this way. I have... Get up to see me that video so I can do a comparison. Mm -hmm. Um, But I read somewhere that she did the last book first. Oh. I, I don't know where to look now. <laughs> just gonna dance. <laughs> oh, come on! We're supposed to be doing this together. We are. So I'm just doing it down here from the floor. <laughs> so, um, she did the last book first, and then wrote the others as sequ or prequels. Wow. Well. So her writing style may have improved greatly. That's what I, I would be. believe. Uh, there's, like I said, there's four books in it, and then a uh, short story. Uh -huh. The books are dealing with dragons. The main character is Simmerine, a princess who is. You were you were talking about her. How would you describe Simmerine? Headstrong, independent, and yeah. Right there. Although she looks really old in this painting. So, yeah, she goes off and offers herself as a dragon's princess in order to keep from marrying someone. The second book, Searching for Dragons, the main character is Mindenbar. The king of the enchanted forest. He's 20 years old, and his castle is described as having too many staircases. <laughs> and there's Calling on Dragons, which is about the main character is Merwin? Merwin? 
Morwen. Morwen. That's it. In which nobody is satisfied. Chapter 21. <laughs> the chapter headings are great. I love the chapter headings. They're awesome. Um... I think my favorite one is In Which Everyone Argues. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's one that's um, In Which the Plot Thickens. And then the fourth book is Talking to Dragons. And it's about Daystar. I'm not going to tell you what he is because, you know, stuff. Spoilers and things. I'm looking here at the, um, this thing here. I think yours will pick it up easier. But see, it's um, the copyrights, 1990 for Dealing with Dragons, Searching for Dragons is 91, Calling on Dragons is 93, Talking to Dragons is 85. Right. So. Yeah, and then there's the short story, Utensil Strength, which is the royal family all getting together. You know, and I don't think I've stuff. actually read that one. You haven't? Mark mm. reads it. Oh, I'm gonna she have to. It. It's really funny. It's yeah. they, the sorcerer <clears throat> is trying to make a magical sword, <laughs> you know, this undefeatable sword, and then his wa wife walks in with a frying pan. <laughs> <laughs> so there's like this magical frying pan, frying pan. doom. <laughs> <laughs> frying pans, who knew? Yeah, right? <laughs> What about the writing, the stories, the ideas do you find most intriguing? What do you like most about it? Well, it's been a while, so the the writing itself, I can't recall exactly. It's the plot that sticks. Yeah. It's always the plot. I have great retention for plot. The, well... At least it's grammatically correct. Yeah. There's lots of books that aren't grammatically correct. And it's if you want to hear Kit Kinetic Bitch, you know, plunk something down in front of her and make her read it, and it haven't been, you know, just terribly written. <laughs> I am currently writing a book, which parts of it take place in letter form. And one I can of my handle characters that. has absolutely no formal schooling. Back. <laughs> and, uh, oh, you should see her. She's camera uh, shy, but she's cringing so hard. It hurts. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's actually funny how much she's cringing. So I'm about to cry here. Yes, her face is turning red. You know, Err. Just, just the thought of it, you know. So, like, every word is misspelled, and... It hurts. The problem is, as long as you ignore the spelling, the grammar's good. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I need to, like... It's phonetic grammar. spelling. Very phonetic. Like, I think she says... She's talking about her son, and spells it S-U-N at one point. <laughs> no... No, 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 no. And like father, she drops the E. So it's T-H-R. That's okay. I can handle people spelling V-Y-E. V-Y-E? Mm-hmm. The word the yeah. comes from the old English ye, which is actually pronounced the. Yeah. So, Y-E is still the... Yeah. I can handle that. Yeah. I can't handle someone calling their son that glowing evil orb in the sky. Yes. Anything else you'd like to add about it? It's a book. Read more books. Books are good for you. Read the first chapter. Okay. Wow! We can't see you at all. Perfect! <laughs> Ha. The first chapter of each book? Well, I usually only do the first chapter for the first book. Okay. Because, you know, spoilers. Spoilers! The Enchanted Forest Chronicles. Dealing with Dragons. Patricia C. Reedy. Is it Reedy or Reed? That's a very good question. W-R-E-D-E. -E. People can comment.
Tell us if we're messing it up. Contents. Chapter 1. In which Simmering refuses to be proper and has a conversation with a frog. Woo! Look at that! <laughs> Linderwall was a large kingdom, just east of the Mountains of Morning, where philosophers were highly respected, and the number five was fashionable. <laughs> The climate was unremarkable. The knights kept their armor brightly polished, mainly for show. It had been centuries since the dragon had come east. There were the usual periodic problems with royal children and uninvited fairy godmothers. Of course. But there were also... Lucinda. There were always the sort of things that could be cleared up by finding the proper prince or princess to marry the unfortunate child a few years later. All in all... Like a hundred? Yeah. Oh, wait. Yeah, that's very godmothers, right? Mm-hmm. All in all, Linderwall was a very prosperous and pleasant place. Simmerin hated it. Simmerin was the youngest daughter of the king of Linderwall, and her parents found her rather trying. Only a little, though. Their first six daughters were perfectly normal princesses, with long golden hair and sweet dispositions, each more beautiful than the last. Simmerin was lovely enough, but her hair was jet black, and she wore it in braids instead of curled and pinned like her sister's. And she wouldn't stop growing. Her parents were quite sure that no prince would want to marry a girl who could look him in the eye instead of gazing up at him becomingly through her lashes. As for the girl's disposition, well, when people were being polite, they said she was strong-minded. When they were angry or annoyed with her, they said she was as stubborn as a pig. The king and queen. Are pigs stubborn? Mm, I don't know. I've never been around a pig, so. Mules are more stubborn than pigs. Yeah. The king and queen did the best they could. They hired the most superior tutors and governesses to teach Simmering all the things a princess ought to know. Dancing, embroidery, drawing, and etiquette. There was a great deal of etiquette. From the proper way to curtsy before a visiting prince, to how loudly it was permissible to scream when being carried off by a giant. Linderwall still had an occasional problem with giants. Simmerine found it all very dull. But she pressed her lips together and learned it anyway. When she couldn't stand it any longer, she would go down to the castle armory and bully the armsmaster into giving her a fencing lesson. As she got older, she found her regular lessons more and more boring. Consequently, the fencing lessons became more and more frequent. When she was 12, her father found out. Fencing is not proper behavior for a princess, he told her in the gentle but firm tone recommended by the court philosopher. Simmering tilted her head to one side. Why not? It's, well, it's simply not done. Simmering considered. Aren't I a princess? Yes, of course you are, my dear, said her father with relief. He'd been bracing himself for a storm of tears, which was the way his other daughters reacted to reprimands. Well, I fence, Simreen said with an air of one delivering an unshakable argument. So it is too done by a princess. That so doesn't make that. it proper, dear, put in her mother gently. Why not? It simply doesn't, the queen said firmly. And that was the end of Simmering's fencing lessons. When she was 14, her father discovered she was making the court magician teach her magic. How long has this been going on? He asked wearily when she arrived in response to his summons. Since you stopped my fencing lessons, Simmering said, I suppose you're going to tell me it isn't proper behavior for a princess. Well, yes, I mean, it isn't proper. Nothing interesting seems to be proper, Simmering said. You might find things more interesting if you applied yourself a little more, dear, Simmerine's mother said. I doubt it, Simmerine muttered, but she knew better than to argue when her mother used that tone of voice, and that was the end of the magic lessons. The same thing happened over the Latin lessons from the court philosopher, the cooking lessons from the castle chef, the economics lessons from the court treasurer, and the juggling lessons from the court minstrel. Simmering began to grow rather tired of the whole business. When she was 16, Simmering summoned her fairy godmother. Simmering, my dear, this sort of thing really isn't done. 
the fairy said, fanning away the scented blue smoke that had accompanied her appearance. People keep telling me that, Cimmerian said. You should pay attention to them then, her grandmother said, her godmother said irritably. Grandmother. Hmm. <laughs> Maybe her godmother is her grandmother. Maybe. I'm not used to being hauled away from my tea without warning, and you aren't supposed to call me unless it's a matter of utmost importance to your life and future happiness. It is of utmost importance to my life and future happiness, Simran said. Oh, very well. You're a bit young to have fallen in love already. Still, you always have been a precocious child. Tell me about him. Simran sighed. It isn't a him. Enchanted, is he? The fairy said with a spark of interest. A frog, perhaps? That used to be quite popular, but it seems to have gone out of fashion lately. Nowadays, all the princes are talking birds or dogs or hedgehogs. <clears throat> Everyone are talking hedgehog. Right? No, no, I'm not in love with anyone. Then what exactly is your problem? The fairy asked in exasperation. This! Simmerine gestured at the castle around her. Embroidery lessons and dancing and... And being a princess! My dear Simmerine, the fairy said shocked, it's your heritage. It's boring. Boring? The fairy did not appear to believe what she was hearing. <gasps> boring. I want to do things, not sit around all day and listen to the court minstrel make up songs about how brave daddy is, how lovely his wife and daughters are. Nonsense, my dear. This is just a stage you're going through. You'll outgrow it soon, and you'll be very glad you didn't do anything rash. Simran looked at her godmother suspiciously. You've been talking to my parents, haven't you? Well, they do try to keep me up to date on what my godchildren are doing. I thought so, Simran said, and bade her fairy godmother a polite goodbye. Very polite. <laughs> to be polite to those people, you know? Yeah. A few weeks later, Simran's parents took her to attorney and stayed them by the mountains. The next kingdom over. Simran was quite sure they were only taking her because her fairy godmother had told them that something had better be done about her, and soon she kept this opinion to herself. Anything was better than the endless rounds of dancing and embroidery lessons at home. Simran realized her mistake almost as soon as they reached their destination. For the king of Statham by the Mountains had a son. He was a golden-haired, blue-eyed, and exceedingly handsome prince whose duties appeared to consist entirely of dancing attendance on Simmerine. "'Isn't he handsome?' Simmerine's lady-in-waiting sighed. "'Yes,' Simmerine said without enthusiasm. "'Unfortunately, he isn't anything else.' "'Whatever do you mean?' the lady-in-waiting said in astonishment. "'He has no sense of humor. He isn't intelligent. "'He can't talk about anything except tourneys, "'and half of what he does say he gets wrong.' I'm glad we're only staying three weeks. I don't think I could stand to be polite to him for much longer than that. But what about your engagement? The lady-in-waiting cried, horrified. What engagement? Simmerine said sharply. <clears throat> the lady-in-waiting tried to mutter something about a mistake, but Simmerine put her chin in her best princess fashion, put up her chin in her best princess fashion, and insisted on an explanation. Finally, the lady-in-waiting broke down. <sighs> I overheard their majesties discussing it yesterday. She sniffled it into her handkerchief. The stipulations and covenants and contracts and settlements have all been drawn up. They're going to sign them the day after tomorrow and announce it on th Thursday. I see, said Simran. Thank you for telling me. You may go. The lady-in-waiting left, and Simran went to see her parents. They were annoyed and a little embarrassed to find that Simran had discovered their plans. They were still very firm about it. We were going to tell you tomorrow when we signed the papers, her father said. We knew you'd be pleased, dear, her mother said, nodding. He's such a good-looking boy. But I don't want to marry Prince Therindel, Simran said. Well, it's not exactly a brilliant match, Simran's father said, frowning. But I didn't think you'd care how big his kingdom is. <laughs> don't tell me that is not a double entendre. I know, right? <laughs> well, okay. Back down there. It's the prince I don't care for, Simran said. That's a great pity, dear, but it can't be helped, Simran's mother said placidly. I'm afraid it isn't likely that you'll get another offer. Then I won't get married at all. Both her parents looked slightly shocked. My dear Simran, said her father, that's out of the question. You're a princess. It simply isn't done. I'm too young to get married. Yes, yeah, she's, what, 18? 16. 16. Your great-aunt Rose was married at 16, her mother pointed out. 
One really can't count all those years she spent asleep under the dreadful fairy's curse. I won't marry the Princess Statham by the mountains, Zimmerine said desperately. It isn't proper. What? said both her parents together. He hasn't rescued me from a giant or an ogre or freed me from a magic spell, Zimmerine said. Both her parents looked uncomfortable. Well, no, said Zimmerine's father. It's a bit late to start arranging it, but we might be able to manage something. I don't think it's necessary, Zimmerine's mother said. She looked reprovingly at Zimmerine. You've never paid any attention to what was or wasn't suitable before, dear. You can't start now. Proper or not, you will marry Prince Therindel three weeks from Thursday. But mother... That's a really short engagement. Yeah. I'll send the wardrobe mistress to your room to start fitting your bride clothes, Simmerine's mother said firmly, and that was the end of the conversation. Simmerine tried to dis tried a more direct approach. <laughs> she went to see Prince Therindel. He was in the castle armory, looking at swords. Good morning, princess, he said when he finally noticed Simmerine. Don't you think this is a lovely sword? Simmerine picked it up. The balance is off. I believe you're right, said Therindel after a moment's study. Pity. Now I'll have to find another. Is there something I can do for you? Yes, said Simmerine. You can not marry me. What? Therindel looked confused. You don't really want to marry me, do you? Simmerine said coaxingly. Well, not exactly. I mean, in a way, that is. Oh, good, said Simmerine, correctly interpreting this muddled reply as no, not at all. Then you'll tell your father you don't want to marry me. I couldn't do that, Therindel said shocked. It wouldn't be right. Why not, Simmerine demanded crossly. Because, because, well, because princes just don't do that. Then how are you going to keep from marrying me? I guess I won't be able to, Therindel said after thinking hard for a moment. How do you like that sword over there, the one with the silver hilt? Simmerine left in disgust and went out to the castle garden. She was very discouraged. It looked as if she were going to marry the Princess Statham by the mountains, whether she wanted to or not. I'd rather be eaten by a dragon, she muttered. That can be arranged, said a voice from beside her left slipper. Simmerine looked down and saw a small green frog looking up at her. I beg your pardon, did you speak, she asked. You don't see anyone else around here, do you? said the frog. Oh, said Simmerine. She'd never met a talking frog before. Are you an enchanted prince? She asked a little doubtfully. No, but I've met a couple of them. And after a while, you pick up a few things, said the frog. Now, why is it that you want to be eaten by a dragon? My parents want me to marry Prince Therindel, Simran explained. And you don't want to? Sensible of you, said the frog. I don't like Therindel. He used to skip rocks across the top of my pond. They always sink into my living room. <laughs> Thank you, Frodo. <laughs> I'm sorry, Simmerine said politely. Well, said the frog, what are you going to do about it? Marrying Therindel? I don't know. I've tried talking to my parents, but they won't listen, and neither will Therindel. I didn't ask what you said about it, the frog snapped. I asked what you're going to do. Nine times out of ten, talking is a way of avoiding, of avoiding doing things. Very important quote, that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then there's a Frodo, who is a little bit of a attention whore. All of your animals are attention whores. Oh, no. Except for Nin. Nin is not. I think Nin is hiding out up in the loft bed up there. Hey! <laughs> Claws, they work. <laughs> <laughs> I do not believe in declawing cats. I don't it's either. Cruel. Yeah, they cut off their knuckles. Yeah, they they some of them take like a mini guillotine to the yeah. tip of their toe, which is the equivalent of the first knuckle. Yeah. Uh, let's see. What kinds of things would you suggest? Simmerine said, stung. You could challenge the prince to a duel, the frog suggested. He'd win, Simmerine said. It's been four years since I've been allowed to do any fencing. You could turn him into a toad. I never got past invisibility in my magic lessons, Simmerine said. Transformations are advanced study. The frog looked at her disapprovingly. Can't you do anything? I can curtsy, Simmerine said disgustedly. 
I know 17 different country dances, nine ways to agree with an ambassador from Cafe <laughs> without actually promising him anything, and 143 embroidery stitches, and I can make Cherry's Jubilee. Cherry's Jubilee, said the frog, and snapped at a passing fly. The castle chef taught me before father made him stop, Serena explained. The frog munched briefly and swallowed and said, I suppose there's no help for it. For it. You'll have to run away. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> run away Simran said I don't like that idea too many things could go wrong you don't like the idea of marrying Prince Therondel either the frog pointed out maybe I can think of some other way of, out of getting married the frog snorted such as Simran didn't answer after a moment the frog said I thought so you want my advice or not <laughs> yes please Simran said Simran after all she didn't have to follow it Go to the main road outside the city and follow it away from the mountains, said the frog. After a while, you'll come to a small pavilion made of gold, surrounded by trees made of silver with emerald leaves. Go straight past it without stopping, and don't answer if anyone calls out to you from the pavilion. Keep on until you reach a hovel. Walk straight up to the door and knock three times. Then snap your fingers and go inside. You'll find some people there who can help you out of your difficulties, replies he Frodo. If you're polite about asking, and they're in the right mood, and that's all. The frog turned abruptly. I like how he announces that that's it. <laughs> yep. The frog turned abruptly and dove into the pool. Thank you very much, Simmering called after it, thinking the frog's advice sounded very odd indeed. She rose and went back into the castle. She spent the rest of the day being fitted and fussed over by her ladies and waiting until she was ready to scream. By the end of the formal ban banquet at which she had to sit next to Prince Therondel and listen to endless stories of his prowess in battle, Simmering was more than ready to take the frog's advice. Late that night, when most of the castle was asleep, Simmering bundled up five clean handkerchiefs and her best crown. Then she dug out the notes she had taken during her magic lessons and carefully cast a spell of invisibility. It seemed so to she work. carries around her magic lesson notes... Wouldn't you? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> well, let's see. It seemed to work, but she was still very watchful as she sneaked out of the castle. After all, it had been a long time since she'd practiced. By morning, Simmering was well outside the city, invisible again, walking down the main road that led away from the mountains. It was hot and dusty, and she began to wish she'd brought a bottle of water instead of the handkerchiefs. She never takes anything practical. You know? In all right. the books. Never. True. Just before noon, she spied a small grove of trees next to the road ahead of her. It looked like a cool, pleasant place to rest for a few minutes, and she hurried forward. When she reached the grove, however, she saw the trees were made of the finest silver, and their shining green leaves were huge emeralds. In the center of the grove stood a charming pavilion made of gold and hung with gold curtains. Simmerine slowed down and looked longingly at the cool green shade beneath the trees. Just then, a woman's voice called out from the pavilion. My dear, you look so tired and thirsty. Come and sit with me and share my luncheon. The voice was so kind and coaxing that Simmerine took two steps toward the edge of the road before she remembered the frog's advice. Oh no, she thought to herself, I'm not going to be caught this easily. She turned without saying anything and hurried on down the road. A little further on, she came to a tiny, wretched-looking hovel made of cracked and weathered gray boards. The door hung slantwise on a broken hinge, and the whole building looked as though it were going to topple over at any moment. Simmering stopped and stared doubtfully at it. But she'd followed the frog's advice this far, and she thought it'd be silly to stop now. So she shook the dust from her skirts, put on her crown so as to make a good impression. She marched up to the door knocked three times and snapped her fingers just as Frog had told her. And she pushed the door open and went in. Y'all want to hear more? You're just going to nope. have to read it. Yep. <laughs> Chapter 2, in which Simmerine discovers the value of a classical education and has some unwelcome visitors. Oh. That was The Enchanted Forest Chronicles by P Patricia Patricia. Patricia. <laughs> See ya, Reedy. Read, Reedy, Reedy. What I comment. Comment.
First book, Dealing with Dragons. Brett the Best here. She could have forced me to be on camera some more. Fine, fine, fine. Get kinetic. Signing out. Toodles. Bye. Oh, that was painful on the ears. <laughs> Let me see if I can thin out my face a little bit. I think you have a beautiful face. I think you have a need for a stronger prescription. <laughs> I'm not wearing my glasses right now, so that could be partially. Yeah, that could be it.